Welcome to this CNBC panel special. I'm Arnold Quizera. Today we are going to have a focus on the circular economy. Now, what is the circular economy? How can it be sustained? And is it practical in the current conditions? Now, to be part of this conversation, tweet us at CNBC Africa. I'm at the real Quizera. Now, many of the tools we need to build the circular economy are already readily available to us. And many businesses and now harnessing them to make their own supply chains more sustainable. However, it's not enough for businesses to simply adopt these tools and practices themselves. But why is adoption of these practices taking longer than many experts previously predicted? And how can it be made sustainable? Now, to break this down for us, we are joined by an experts panel. Uh, and this panel has uh, Cherie Scholes. She is the CEO of Petco. We also have Mr. Kiriakos Papunos. Uh, he's the managing director of Papunos Sustainability Consultants. And Nancy Tiger, she is the head of conservation's program, WWF Kenya. Uh, great to have you on. Uh, welcome back to CNBC, Nancy. There. Uh, I just want us to start uh, with uh, Sheree, uh, just to break it down for our viewers uh, why this, important, uh, this conversation is important. What is a circular economy? The circular economy is certainly a buzzword today, but it's a change from the way that we currently live, which is based on a linear economy, where we effectively take, make, and throw away, and we lose the resources that we've extracted. Whereas a circular economy is an attempt to take those resources and keep them in circulation for longer. Uh, Sherry, I want to stay with you there. Uh, why, why is it important to have this conversation in the current circumstances that we are in? And here I'm talking about the COVID-19 pandemic and recovery of economies. I think it's really relevant because we are, are taking too much from the planet. There is no planet B. And if we, if we overutilize resources, we're going to run out and put strain on natural systems. And I think that we've seen the result of that with the COVID pandemic, the encroachment onto natural systems, the use of too much carbon, and a circular economy is about a regenerative, restorative economy. It's about taking care of nature. It's about looking after people. It's about being economically sustainable. And it's the way that we have to move to the future. Uh, I want to bring uh, Ms. Akriakos uh, into the conversation. You have an area of experience uh, in dealing with formulation of policies uh, around circular economies. Uh, uh, what has been the major learning lesson for you over this 20-year period of time? Well, as, as was rightly and handsomely said by Cherry, is um, uh, moving from the old systems to, um, uh, to the new systems, to circular systems, from linear to circular. And of course, the biggest challenges is these uh, changes that are required at different steps in the supply chain to make sure that we do have um, circular sub supply chains and sustainable supply chains. So a lot of things are changing for the industry. Uh, the industry needs to redesign processes. They need to redesign products. They need to look for issues like recyclability, repairability, uh, use of uh, recycled material, recycled content in their products. So there are too many changes, and uh, the reason that it's taking time is because it's, it, 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 is, it is a significant uh, shift from what we used to do and what we used to know uh, to getting to the, to the circular uh, supply chain. So uh, it, it takes time for the companies, uh, and of course it takes different tools to facilitate this shift from the old to the new. Uh, what I've heard from you is it takes time. Uh, and that's where I think I want to bring Nancy into the conversation. Uh, formulation of these policies, uh, adoption of them, and ad adaptation as well. Uh, we have some countries with very good policies on paper. Kenya uh, is one example. Uh, 2018, you know, they banned uh, single-use plastics on paper. But adoption and adaptation of such a policy has taken a while. Uh, how can these, you know, the governments ensure that policies are adopted and adapted? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's true. Uh, I think Kenya, like a number of other African countries, have very progressive uh, policies, and I would say for Kenya, and especially on the plastic ban, uh, which uh, was done 
yeah, two or so years ago, you know, after quite a lot of struggle on getting that done, uh, given that there were issues of whether is it just is at the right time and so on. Uh, but of course, there is no better time, you know, to do it than the time that it was done. So I think the policies are there. Uh, what we have seen as a major challenge for Kenya and I'm sure many other African uh, nations is the issue of implementation. You know, so the policy is there. Is it being implemented? Uh, why is it, is it not being implemented? Is it the issue of uh, uh, having a just transition? Uh, those are the challenges that have come up. And I can give an example, like for Kenya, for instance, uh, having banned the plastic bags, uh, carrier bags, as we call them, it became a bit difficult to say, so what was the option? There are no bags, so what becomes the option for people, for the women who are selling their products in the market? And as we speak now, there are options that are not necessarily any better, probably, than the plastic bags that were there. So I think it is looking you know, at the whole system, looking at the policies, and looking at once we have this ban, then what does it mean in terms of implementation if there are no options? I think that is where we are struggling. Uh, but uh, I would uh, lord and add to say that it is important to have a policy document because once it's there, then it is a foundation for what we want to do going forward. Uh, but I think what is more important is implementation of this. And this has to be done by ourselves, the people, and also the companies that are also producing these kind of products. Nancy, staying with you uh, there and from what I'm learning and hearing from you, is there, is there a need to localize these policies? Uh, certainly. Uh, I think uh, important is uh, we've seen, you know, some of these policies work excellently, uh, and especially in developed nations, issues of plastic, issues of recycling in many developed nations, in Germany, in other many developed nations. Uh, so it would be good to have a global level policy framework because then that actually provides a foundation for our work as nations globally. But I think it is then more important to have this domesticated and localized so that it responds to the local needs, it responds to a just transition, it responds you know, to the needs and where the, the, the countries are currently at. So I think it is very, very important to have this localized. And it's only in their localization or domestication that then they are, we are able to implement them. If it's just a global policy framework, it becomes difficult to actually uh, legislate it or even implement it. And implementation also means resources are set aside for the implementation of these policies. So without domestication, then that would be very, very difficult. And Nancy, uh, just hold your horses there. I'm going to come back to you in terms of uh, best examples of how these have been implemented uh, somewhere else. I, I want to bring Sherry uh, back into the conversation. And I, I want to tap into one of your many hearts. Uh, you're a board member uh, of Packaging South Africa. And uh, what, what has been the major challenge there in convincing other members to move towards a more environmentally sustainable packaging policy? I think one of the key problems has been actually a lack of consensus on what more environmentally sustainable packaging actually is. You know, there's been a lack of knowledge about the impact of poorly designed packaging that has little or no value at the end of its life or, or which is not compatible with the recycling infrastructure currently on the ground in that particular area. Another factor has been a lack of access to an independent body of knowledge to guide choices towards more sustainable packaging. Historically, packaging has always been designed to be fit for purpose. In other words, to safely deliver food and beverages amongst other things to consumers, and also to attract consumers' attention in a highly competitive environment. So producers were actually not held accountable for their packaging after it had been consumed. And then I think the third key item for me is relating to collaboration. Because historically, industry has found collaboration in a competitive environment difficult. But there's now a growing awareness that sustainability, waste management, and circular economy planning, and even R&D, in fact, need collaboration. So that will be a mindset change. Uh, Sherry, just to continue there with you, uh, you've talked about competition. Um, another conversation uh, that Nancy brought up is implementation, and uh, Kriakos will also dive into this uh, uh, just after uh, your statements. How, how would you advise companies, one, to remain 
competitive uh, while also adapting to these changes or proposals? I think that, first of all, that supportive regulatory environment is really key and it can drive implementation to become much more action orientated by being clear in terms of metrics and measurements, defining roles and responsibilities, unlocking funding for green development, minimizing red tape and actually promoting green procurement as well. But from industry side specifically, I think that more cooperation through the whole packaging value chain can drive action by adopting design for recycling guidelines to maintain the highest value possible for packaging, to ensure that all the packaging that industry places on the market is correctly marked so that it can be sorted for recycling after collection. The development of end use markets to absorb recyclate is key. You can't collect and store something if you can't make it into something else. I think more and improved infrastructure for collecting, sorting and recycling can drive action. We need both quantity and quality for value and for feasibility. And I think the final driver is education and awareness to drive mm -hmm. behavior change so that citizens take responsibility for engaging with industry and participating in any of the programs that industry put forward, accepting products with recycled content, thinking about the size of products they buy. So collaboration across the value chain and interaction with consumers will really help to get implementation moving. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you there, Sheree. Uh, uh, Kyriakos. Implementation, uh, how can we make it more actionable? Well, like every other strategy, um, you need to decide, first of all, where you're heading. You need to set the target. And uh, as we say, unless you know where you're going, you will never get there. So you need to decide where, where you're heading. At the same time, you need to start thinking about the tools that we are going to use to take you there because we're shifting from a service that was traditionally provided by the government or the local government and then uh, we're shifting into uh, involving the private sector the industry into that operation so we need to decide in which way uh, which tools for example will it be epr will it be uh, drs deposit systems which ways are you going to use and how you will combine the tools because what really works is the combination of tools and not a specific tool so you need to make sure that you follow up and you add uh, different tools to the toolbox so that you can have this uh, shift to a more recycling uh, economy. At the same time, you need to uh, ensure that uh, the capacity, the, the recycling capacity in the country is increasing over time. So you need to make sure that there is money for collection, there is infrastructure for, for sorting and for recycling uh, the different materials, and who will provide this investment uh creating of course market for markets for the secondary material because you do not collect recyclables for the sake of collecting recyclables but to make sure that you you have secondary resources to produce new products or similar products so you need to make sure that there is an uptake there is a capacity to uptake the material in the market of course you need to uh to, to place the citizen as the focal point in all this uh, evolution because uh, to meet high recycling targets, you need sorting at source. So you need to involve the citizen so that the citizen will be educated and learn to sort their waste. Uh, of course, you need to make sure that there are clear rules and responsibilities between the industry, the municipalities, the government, the monitoring authority. And of course, there is enforcement of the legislation, which means that making sure that everybody's taking their uh, respons responsibilities according to the legislation. And of course, the, the government also to monitor the operation of the systems, of the tools that will be in place to affect this shift to the recycling society. Uh, uh, Nancy, I want to bring you back into the conversation. Uh, you, you've had Kriakos there. He has mentioned a number of challenges, capacity building, one of them. Uh, uh, there's another challenge of you know, investment into these industries, uh, attracting investment into them, and also uh, the quote-unquote cartels uh, that have been benefiting. 
uh, from you know previous practices not wanting to shift because there will be a loss of revenue uh, for them in case of the movement uh, to things like uh, you know the dissolution of single-use plastic and the likes. Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, thanks. Uh, and it's interesting, actually, you ask that way, because, uh, again, examples from the region, why it took so many years for Kenya to even burn plastic, uh, was uh, mainly from the private sector, you know, feeling that we have invested in this business, uh, you bring in the issue of uh, uh, employment, uh, and so on. And when the private sector bought in, then uh, options have been found. And as I've said, whether the options are the best or not, uh, that is something else that needs, needs to actually be discussed. Uh, but I think uh, the issue of uh, investments and companies or private sector feeling that it doesn't make you know, business sense to invest in this space or to recycle, I think that is now ending uh, you know, as we go along. And as the private sector is also critically getting into the issue of sustainability, knowing that we cannot have businesses on a dead planet. So if there is no business on a dead planet, then it means we must invest today, even if it's expensive to invest today. And I think uh, increasingly, and we, we can say that, uh, you know, with companies, uh, Sherry's here, Petco, the Coca-Colas, there are many companies that are now thinking uh, that... Uh, our investments are not going to be secure unless we are doing this in a sustainable way or in a secure planet, and therefore the, the investments that are coming in. This is not going to change overnight, uh, and especially in our region, uh, because we have investments over many years, companies that have been in some of this space for 60 plus years, and then you want this changed, uh, and the cost of changing you know, to more sustainable practices is not cheap. However, in the long term, it is cheaper than you know what is going to happen. As we are saying, you cannot have businesses on a dead planet. So that becomes the basis of, our, of any discussion that we may have. Uh, and therefore, as long as it makes business sense and it does make, make business sense, then it is important that even in the implementation of any policy, uh, as investments are coming in, uh, especially in these sectors that are producing a lot of, uh, let's say, plastics, uh, or we do need plastic, uh, for us to run our business, then that has to be closed so that there is extended uh, producer responsibility as part of the investment so that you produce and we have to show a way of how are we going to manage what we have produced. I have heard, of course, from, uh, I think it is Sherry or Craig, was about, uh, of course, citizens getting engaged in uh, ensuring that they are managing the waste. In, again, many of our spaces, uh, we realize that we don't have proper waste management systems. Forget even about plastics only. It's basically the entire waste system uh, that is not functional, is not working, is not circular. And probably maybe that's where we even need to begin because even if, uh, uh, even if we were able to, you know, the, the private sector is able to engage in the extended producer responsibility actions, if the waste is not collected, if it is not sorted, it doesn't. It be. It actually becomes very expensive to manage that waste, and we cannot do it in isolation. So it's not just about circular economy for plastics. It has to be a whole waste management continuum. You know, a different paradigm shift in the way we manage this in our nations as is today. Uh, great, and also you're just giving us a segue into uh, my next question there uh, to, to Shiri. You know, the paradigm shift. But why is the circular economy still so difficult? to implement? Cherie? I think whenever we change systems, it's really difficult to get going because we don't know where to start. We don't know who is going to do what. And I wanted to pick up on a point that Nancy made about waste management in general, because EPR is just one of the tools that is available to society and to governments, and, and Kyriakis picked up on that as well. So I think, for example, if organic waste is taken care of, that's by far the biggest mm -hmm. fraction of your, your household waste stream. And in other parts of the world, for example, in Malta, they found that when they took care of the organic waste, the quantity and quality of recyclables increased. So I think the circular, a view to, to moving to a circular economy needs to look at all waste management, mm -hmm. construction rubble, 
leakage into the environment, organic waste. And it will help to encourage people to start thinking about how we live, what we do with everything when we finished with it, not only for plastics. I think that packaging generally accounts for perhaps 14 to 15% of a household waste stream and Kyriakos would have better figures than me. But I think in Africa, particularly where there isn't solid waste management operationally now, there's a very good opportunity to look at all of these things, including recyclables and secondary resources whilst the systems are developed. So I'm optimistic that we're moving far better towards a circular economy than we have been to date. Uh, thank you, Sherry. Kyriakos, uh, do you want to touch base on that? Why is it so difficult you know, to implement a circular economy? Well, as we said earlier, there is uh, a paradigm change. There is uh, the need to also uh, involve the citizen. So it takes time to educate people. Uh, you need to redesign supply chains. You need to make sure that um, there is enough capacity in each country uh, for the treatment of the material. You need to make sure that there are uh, markets for the secondary material. So. There are different uh, different changes, uh, beginning, of course, from the change of the of the mindset of people. Start uh, thinking of producing and throwing away, and start uh, stop think stop uh, thinking of producing and throwing away, and start thinking of producing and reusing uh, uh, the resources as many times as possible in new life cycles. So we need to move away from short termism, as it is called from short-term planning to a long-term planning, and uh, look at things like uh, life, uh, life cycle designs, um, uh, and, and of course, taking responsibility for the full life cycle of products. That's why we talk about extended producer responsibility, because it ex extends to the whole life cycle of the products. And of course, by using the right tools, we give the right incentives, uh, the carrots and the sticks to the industry, to start redesigning their products and making sure that they provide all the infrastructure either to reuse or to collect their material back uh, so that they can have a secondary raw material to use them repeatedly in their products, either parts or raw materials, so that we can eventually get closer to that what we, to, to what we call circular economy. Yeah, uh, because I want to stay with you there. Uh, uh, the materials you're talking about, uh uh, some skeptics have said, have come out to say they are still quite expensive, which will make the end product eventually expensive, and that day is still a challenge. Now, how do you counter that? There are, there are two things here. Uh, of course, as we all know, there is economies of scale. So if we increase the uptake of recycling, uh, recyclable material and we produce more products with recyclable material, the prices will go down. That's one thing. The other thing is that there is a fallacy when we talk about expensive and cheap uh, options, because many times we compare uh, what is um, in the circular economy, what is costed fully with all the cost associated with the product compared with the, with the uh, linear economy, where there are a lot of externalities in a product that we do not even take into account in the pricing. If we don't care, take care of the, of the material when they become waste and somebody else pays for that cost, it doesn't mean there is no cost. It's just shift, shifted from the price of the product. So we need to make sure that we, we avoid this fallacy uh, of comparing different things, apples and oranges. And of course, when you talk about protecting the environment and we say that it costs, of course, it costs much more not to protect the environment, but it's, it's, it's cost in terms of externalities cost of uh, poor health, cost of uh, uh, poor living conditions, um, sickness, lo loss of lives. How do you put value on that because of, the, of all the environmental problems created by not protecting the environment? So throwing away resources is definitely a, a non-viable model. We need to make sure that they have uh, repeated life cycles. And of course, as I said, we need to move away from the short-term planning to the long-term planning and make sure that whatever we do is not just a little uh, less unsustainable, 
but we are planning for real sustainable supply chains. Uh, Nancy, do, do, do you think uh, technology uh, could make uh, one of these products cheaper and also uh, create long-term usage and make the whole system uh, run for longer periods? Uh, yeah, uh, and I want to start somewhere, you know, picking up from Kriakos as I respond to that question. You know, when we are talking about, uh, uh, you know, what is sustainable and the cost of that sustainability, I think what uh, maybe we also need to remember, even as the private sector, is that uh, people necessarily require services. It is not the products. It's the services they require. And I can give you an example. In Kenya, where I am now, um, we buy a lot of uh, bottled water. And why do we carry bottled water? It's probably because the, water's, the water is unsafe or we do not trust the water in our taps. But what we need is not bottled water. What uh, citizens are interested in is safe drinking water. So probably there are also other fundamental issues, you know, in the provision of the service, uh, you know, as opposed to the product. It's not just, you know, we want bottled water but what is required is safe water. And maybe that is also something that uh, as we look at even uh, you know, uh, consumer responsibility and also producer responsibility, maybe these are things to look at. But coming back to the issue of technology, yes, certainly uh, technology would be an integral part in ensuring that uh, circular economy works. Uh, we have talked about the issue of waste management and how it doesn't necessarily, we don't have proper systems in our countries. The countries where they have managed to do this very well, most of them have used technology, you know, so that if it is take back schemes, you know, where do you get, where is the waste, when is it to be collected? So technology has a, you know, a whole, uh, 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 you know, it plays a big role, you know, in terms of just ensuring that services are smooth and are efficient. Uh, but then also in the, on the issue of product redesign, uh, as we are talking about redesigning products, I think technology will also come in uh, very, very strongly where we are looking at, um, we do need the, produce, the product, probably we need the packaging, but then what is this uh, that technology can give us so that whatever it is we are using then can be recyclable. And what cannot be recyclable, then probably we don't need it. Because uh, in a planet, there's nothing that is lost. If you use it, it has to be somewhere. So if it is not recycle, recyclable, then we probably do not need that. And technology would give us an opportunity, you know, to invent and innovate. So that's how I would see technology coming up in terms of uh, supporting uh, and facilitating a circular economy. Uh, very detailed there. I want to come back to you, Kiriakos, uh, and Sherry, uh, please piggy bank off him uh, when he's done. Uh, and this is regarding opportunities uh, in the sector. And here, I, I want, uh, unemployment is the biggest challenge facing you know, many leaders on the continent at the moment. Could this be an opportunity uh, to not only diversify the economies, but also uh, bring about new jobs to the markets? Th thank you for this question. I think this is very important, and of course it's important everywhere. Uh, employment is one of the biggest challenges everywhere and one of the biggest challenges for the governments. Well, the good news is that when we replace, when we shift from, recyc from uh, landfilling to recycling, uh, we create much more, uh, much, much more uh, many jobs uh, in the market. Uh, for every job we replace uh, in landfilling, in the landfilling business, we create 25, up to 25 new jobs in the recycling market, uh, especially if the recycling is done in the country, if, if the final product is produced in the country. So you see that it's much more labor intensive. And of course, of course it creates uh, also um, high level jobs for engineers, for managers, for accountants, uh, for uh, communicators, uh, so the, 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 the potential is there to create much more uh, jobs. And of course, what is also important in the area, having spent some time in uh, South Africa, working uh, in South Africa, uh, it's of course the informal sector. There is um, a sector with uh, waste pickers, people that collect pa packaging and other recyclable materials uh, that are working uh, directly as uh, individuals or as very small uh, family businesses. And of course, one of the challenges there uh, and one of the opportunities is to make sure that you have the systems to upgrade these people so that they become the waste management sector of the country by joining forces, by creating waste management companies eventually, and by undertaking all these new operations that will mean separate collection of waste, 
sorting stations to sort waste, and recycling facilities to recycle the material. So there is a huge potential there, huge potential for, for employment, and a huge potential to upgrade people that are at the lower end of the, of the working scale, to upgrade and become uh, people working in businesses, setting up their own businesses, and uh, creating a, a good income for their families. Yes, I concur with uh, you, Kiriakos. Bring it back off, Kiriakos. Yes, I, I think, you know, job creation is absolutely vital and really important. And when I look at the opportunities, particularly in small and micro businesses on the management of waste, I think that that's very exciting. And once you've, you've, sorted the, the collection and the recycling out, I think there's going to also be job creation opportunities in the down market size, you know, the products made from recycled content, whether it's new fabrics, new parts, I think there's opportunities for technology learning and for setting up downstream businesses. So it's an expanded supply chain, I think. Uh, sure, I just want to stay with you there. I want to, to use like best practices uh, and uh, can name a few countries on the continent, uh, Seychelles, Mauritius. Uh, how can and what are the lessons they can pick from others, uh, Rwanda inclusive, uh, in ensuring that, you know, they adopt these practices? I think that one of the opportunities that's available to all of us today is that there are many case studies from all around the world. We often think that informal sectors are only involved in, in countries or continents like Africa and India. Interestingly, Kyriakos will share with you about some of the Eastern European countries that also have informal sectors. So I think we have a body of knowledge that we can call on to actually unpack and see what we can adapt in other countries, what can work. There are many similarities. The technologies that we use for recycling, the, the payment options, it's all commodities based and the technologies are very similar. So the challenges that we face may be country specific, but many of them are actually shared by others. So collaboration, I think, and engaging is, is very important. We have set up in South Africa an organization called the African Marine Waste Network, which is run by the Sustainable Seas Trust. And that is one example of a collaborative effort for Africa to really look at waste management practices, learnings from countries to try to ensure that all the coastal cities of Africa can attract the best part of possible economic development or tourism by engaging and stopping waste management at source, by looking at land-based problems to stop leakage into the rivers. So I think that's one positive and concrete example of how Professionals, governments, NGOs, and industry are actually sitting in a forum together to see how we can share and roll out best practice across the continent. Uh, and Nancy, uh, there have been concerns by organizations uh, in many parts of Africa, and uh, your own organization, the one that you run, uh, there has had, you know, concerns around government and the private sector not doing enough, uh, you know, to be effective in addressing, uh, you know, the lack of collaboration to name but a few to ensure that, you know, there is sustainability. Now, that's a challenge uh, there, but what could be the solution? Yeah, uh, looking at uh, the challenge, uh, and I think in the past and what we have seen happening is uh, we thought or governments thought that enforcement was sufficient to take us where we needed to, to move to. Uh, but you realize enforcement is not necessarily sufficient. Uh, but uh, for instance, the collaboration between the private sector, the civil society, the government, uh, and more so the government and the private sector, that is where solutions are going to come from. 
because the, the private sector is the one that is generating this. Uh, it is the private sector that very likely would have solutions to this. And they have come up with very innovative solutions. So I think that is what has been a challenge, you know, initially where even in our laws, our, uh, our regulations in the past, it was you need to stop producing this or you need to have this recycled. It is not as linear, you know, as that. I think uh, what we are seeing increasingly is as the private sector sits with government, sits with civil society like ourselves, then we are saying, what can we do together? Because we need the products, we need the services. We have one planet, I think Ryokas has said, we have only one planet. So what do we need to, to do together to you know, come up with innovative solutions? And I think this is what we are now seeing. If you look at the current uh, generation of legislations that are coming up again across our African uh, nations, in Kenya also, is you know the extended producer responsibility and these are guidelines and legislations being developed jointly with the private sector because they are key in ensuring that they are implemented we are also looking at a just transition we are also looking at progressively you know moving from one level of waste to ensuring that our waste management is managed or the continuum is actually properly is effective and this cannot be done by law or legislation alone so that is where the private sector is coming in. And as we speak now, we are seeing a lot of that engagement and deliberations on what can work, what uh, enabling environment is required by the private sector. And then as the civil society, we are coming in also and saying, uh, of course, we are looking at just transition. We are looking at communities not being disenfranchised already from pollution, which is already happening. And with most of our communities, especially the poorest living in the oceans or along the beaches, where most of this pollution ends up. So we are looking at what would sustainable development mean for them. And picking up from Korea, because I think what I, we are also seeing is that uh, whereas uh, this was looked at in the past by the private sector as a loss of jobs, because you have machinery, you have industries producing this, I think uh, what we are now seeing is there could be more jobs in recycling, more jobs in uh, managing waste, uh, you know, more, more jobs in a sustainable way than the old ways that we've been having. So I think uh, this is a partnership, the private sector, the government, and the civil society representing the people and the planet, and these are the things that will not stop for themselves, like the air we breathe, then that is how we come in together to provide and get a solution. It can only be found in a collaborative way, not top down, not horizontally, but together, uh, together as uh, collaboratively. Uh, it seems like uh, we are running out of time as the conversation just is just getting started. Nancy, I'm going to come back to you for closing remarks, and those closing remarks will should be very optimistic. Uh, you will have a minute for that. Uh, Kiriakou is coming to you now for your closing remarks. I want you to give us, you know, uh, uh, an idea of how government uh, and uh, can can facilitate or balance this out in this COVID-19 period. You know, a circular economy while also recovering uh, from the downfalls of the pandemic. Well, I think it's a, it is an opportunity for the restart of the economies to move into more sustainable practices and create new jobs through circular economy and recycling. That's uh, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing that is important, of course, and I'll pick up from what Nancy was just saying, that there is a this is a collaborative um, uh, road. Uh, the the industry is taking a responsibility to finance and many times to operate the systems, the recycling systems. And when you give responsibility to the industry, you need to make sure that you allow enough flexibility for the industry to get the job done. And, and of course, the state will always be there to monitor that the job is done as it mm -hmm. should be done. Uh, and I can tell you from the experience from Europe, where we have uh, producers, uh, producers responsibility for more than 25 years, that uh, in the countries we have the best results. We have a government that understands the issues and the dynamics in the EPR business and nurtures and helps support the industry with different tools to provide the results. Uh, and at the same time, you have an industry that understands their role and cooperate nicely with the government and the municipalities where, where, according to the setup of the system because there is different systems in different countries. And is, and, and is this collaboration and this uh, understanding between the two main players, which is the industry and the general public sector that provides the actual results. And as I said, we can see best, uh, the best results in countries like 
um, Belgium and Netherlands and some other countries and Germany, where there is a good understanding and a good cooperation between the industry and the private sector in applying the different tools, primarily, of course, extended pr producer responsibility. Uh, uh, Sheree, closing remarks there. Thank you very much, uh, Kriakos. Closing remarks, in, and I want you to focus on uh, producer responsibility. How much more can producers do in ensuring that uh, these targets are met? Producers, I think, can can do a lot. The the words that I really picked out from both Nancy and Kyriakos is partnership, absolutely key, collaboration. And I think the other really important element to bring in is, is in fact evolution or flexibility. Because I think that industry is, is geared to move quickly when policy is clear and metrics are clear and roles and responsibilities are defined. And in an environment that is supportive, where the, where the regulators can actually provide the rules but can actually understand what the dynamics are and be there to work alongside industry. I think producer responsibility will certainly keep evolving. And I'm really optimistic. I'm seeing a big increase in producers wanting to take responsibility, seeing the opportunities, unpacking the new technologies that are being developed all around the world for both reuse, mechanical recycling, chemical recycling. So I think I would say that partnership, collaboration, and flexibility will really get producers moving along the road that we need them to. Thank you, uh, Sherry. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time, but Nancy, I want to come to you uh, for closing remark. We have only one minute. Optimistic way forward. Yeah, uh, optimistic, maybe not too optimistic. Not too optimistic, we cannot have businesses on a dead planet. Optimistic solutions lie with us. And if it has, in Kenya, it has worked and we are very happy without plastic uh, bags. We didn't think we would survive. We have and we are happier now. So I think uh, solutions are there, innovations are there. It is possible to reduce, it's possible to reuse, and it's actually uh, possible to completely eliminate the plastics or other materials that we cannot recycle. And this has been done elsewhere. Why cannot, can this not be done in our continent if it has worked elsewhere? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nancy. Now, unfortunately, I have to bring this educational conversation to an end. I want to thank our guests today, uh, Sherry Scholes, she's the CEO of PECO, uh, Mr. Kiriakos Papunos is the Managing Director of Papuno Sustainability Consultants, and Mrs. Nancy Gitaiga, she is the Head of Conservation Programs at WWF Kenya. Now, if you want to be part of this conversation, tweet us at CNBC Africa. I'm at The Real Quizera. Have a good day. <laughs>